clickbait, misinformation, so-called fake news, if 2020 felt a bit like a propaganda nightmare, it's nothing compared to the terrifying power of Hitler's propaganda machine. Carefully orchestrated propaganda campaigns allowed Hitler and the Nazis to sow hatred, encourage violence, and get away with unimaginable atrocities. Life in Germany after the First World War was bleak. After losing the war and being made to sign the harsh Treaty of Versailles, Germany was forced to relinquish huge amounts of territory and the country fell into a deep recession. Unemployment was sky high and inflation was running rampant. In 1914, before the war, a loaf of bread cost the equivalent of 13 cents. By the end of the war in 1919, the cost had doubled to 26 cents. By 1922, three years after the war had ended, a loaf of bread cost $700. But things would get so, so much worse in the post-war years. By the end of 1923, the price of bread had skyrocketed to the equivalent of $100 billion. The economy had collapsed and the German currency had become worthless, unable to feed their families or make ends meet. Morale among the German population plummeted. This astounding reversal of fortunes for the once mighty nation created the perfect conditions for the Nazis to rise to power. The National Socialist Party, or the Nazis, came to power in 1933 and Hitler wasted no time in implementing his devious plans to restore Germany to its former glory. Over the next few years, he began to rebuild the German military in direct violation of the Versailles Treaty, attempted to boost morale by praising the German people as a superior race, and blamed all of Germany's problems on so-called traitors like communists, Jews, and other minorities. In 1939, with the invasion of Poland, Hitler launched the Second World War and implemented his brutal final solution to what he called the Jewish problem. It was estimated that 5 to 6 million Jews, up to two-thirds of all Jews living in Europe before the war, were starved, tortured, used as slave labor, and systematically murdered in Nazi death camps like Auschwitz during the Holocaust. How was Hitler able to get away with such unimaginable atrocities? The truth is that none of it would have been possible without Hitler's propaganda machine. Within weeks of the Nazis taking power, Hitler established the Ministry for Popular Enlightenment and Propaganda to spread National Socialist ideas, and he was very clear about the ministry's purpose. In 1924, Hitler was quoted as saying that propaganda's task is not to make an objective study of the truth insofar as it favors the enemy and then set it before the masses with academic fairness. Its task is to serve our own right always and unflinchingly. At the head of this all-important ministry was a man named Josef Goebbels. Goebbels was a gifted speaker and a talented propagandist, and he would go on to be the man largely responsible for the German people's favorable opinion of the Nazi regime. The Nazis' propaganda campaigns were so successful because they targeted the weaknesses and aspirations of different classes of Germans. Under Goebbels' direction, the ministry crafted unique messages for different audiences and used advanced advertising techniques for the day to spread their nefarious ideas throughout German society. The military rearmament campaign was a clear violation of the Versailles Treaty, but also created many jobs in a struggling economy and helped the Nazis secure the support of the working classes. Messages targeting business owners who had suffered after the war placed the blame for all of Germany's recent troubles on communists and Jews and claimed that Germany had been stabbed in the back and betrayed by foreign aggressors after World War I. The key themes of propaganda targeting the middle and upper classes focused on the supposed purity and racial supremacy of the German people. Nazi propaganda infiltrated all areas of German life, from education and industry to science and entertainment, and the ministry used all forms of media to spread their messages and present Germany as the defender of Western culture. Art and radio and music and film and theater were all harnessed to further the Nazis' agenda. Everything from the Nazis' uniforms to the party's strict hierarchy echoed a strong military theme and appealed to Germans who wanted to regain the country's former glory as a military power. War was glorified as a way for the Germans to avenge themselves against their enemies, and a propaganda campaign rebranded the post-war years as part of a 30 years war, one that started in 1914 with the onset of World War I, and one that wouldn't end until Germany was victorious and restored to its former glory. Painted in this light, the Nazis were able to convince the German public that their enemies were planning to attack them at any moment, and the Nazis were able to claim that the invasion of Poland at the start of World War II was simply an act of self-defense. This militaristic theme was on prominent display during the many rallies held by Hitler. Nazi party rallies were held annually in Nuremberg to display the power and might of the Nazi regime and gain popular support for the party. Often lasting for more than a week, thousands of spectators would flood the fairgrounds to attend folk festivals and watch parades of specially selected SS and military troops 
who best represented the Aryan ideal as they marched through the grounds turning to Hitler who was situated at the very top of the massive grandstands to recognize him with the signature Nazi salute. The Nazis knew that it wasn't enough to convince the adult Germans to follow them, they had to target the next generation of Germans and turn them into devoted Nazis too. In 1937, Hitler outlawed the Boy Scouts and all other youth groups except for his own version, the Hitler Youth. Under the guise of typical scouting activities like hiking, camping, and survival training, the Hitler Youth was a way for the Nazis to remove children from the influence of their parents and indoctrinate them into their anti-Semitic ideology. The program was so effective that many children would denounce their parents or even report them for behaving in ways the Nazis considered unacceptable, such as being tolerant towards Jews. The real goal of the Hitler Youth, though, was to create more soldiers for the German army, and over time the boys' branch of the group became more and more militaristic training young boys to march, handle weapons, and prepare for war. The Nazis had complete power over German newspapers and were able to control what news the German people read. They used newspapers like Die Stürmer, the attacker, to further their anti-Semitic agenda, especially in periods prior to the passage of anti-Semitic legislation. Before the 1935 Nuremberg race laws were enacted, the Nazis used newspapers extensively to gain acceptance or at least tolerance of their new racist policies. Under the new laws, anyone with three or four Jewish grandparents, regardless of whether they were practicing Judaism or self-identified with their Jewish roots, were excluded from citizenship, denied political rights, and forbidden from marrying anyone of German blood. Graphic cartoons in Die Stormer portrayed Jews as hideous and frightening subhuman enemies of the German people, obsessed with money, sex, and power. The Nazis were portrayed as simply stepping in to restore order, and the German people were encouraged to stand aside and passively accept their horrible treatment of Jews. One of the Nazis' greatest propaganda weapons was the film industry. The Nazis were suspicious at first since they thought that the film industry was controlled by Jews, but Goebbels saw the opportunity to influence the thoughts and beliefs of the German people through film. He purged the industry of undesirables and offered high-profile positions and unlimited resources to those who were loyal to the Nazi cause. Some films focused on depicting Germans as racially, culturally, and militarily superior and glorified the Nazi party. One of Goebbels' favorite directors was Leni Riefenstahl, and she directed many films for the Nazis, including Triumph of the Will, an aesthetically pleasing film covering the 1934 Nazi Party rally. Other films had a darker theme. The Eternal Jew, directed by Fritz Hippler, demonized the Jewish people as subhuman, wandering cultural parasites who were bent on destroying German culture. In the years leading up to the start of World War II, the Nazis were making little effort to hide their violations of the Versailles Treaty and were being incredibly blatant about their horrific ideas and plans. So why did no one stop them? In short, their propaganda machine was working just as hard outside of Germany as it was within the country. In the days before the internet, it was much easier for governments to control the narrative and take charge of what outsiders were allowed to see about the inner workings of their country. They took steps to mislead foreign governments into thinking the Nazis were simply making reasonable demands to rebuild their country, while downplaying their anti-Semitic rhetoric and increasingly violent treatment of Jews. Just three years before the onset of World War II, Nazi Germany hosted the 1936 Olympic Games, inviting the world into their country in the midst of their remilitarization and anti-Semitism. This event was yet another grand propaganda campaign designed to fool the world and bolster the German people. Though Jewish German athletes were forbidden to compete in the games, the Nazis toned down their anti-Semitic rhetoric in the papers and radio, and they cleaned up their cities removing Jews on welcome signs and blatantly racist posters. Visiting athletes and delegates were blissfully unaware of the true extent of the Nazis' hatred for the Jews and their increasingly violent treatment of them. Beloved Nazi film director Leni Riefenstahl filmed the entire event for use as pro-German and pro-Nazi propaganda in the months and years to come, showcasing the Nazis as heroic leaders who had turned their country around and had shown the world how superior the German people were. Later, as World War II dragged on, the world finally began hearing whispered rumors of the atrocities being committed in Nazi concentration camps. The propaganda machine once again went to work to quash these reports. The Nazis went so far as to allow the International Red Cross to visit one of these camp ghettos, inviting representatives to tour the Theresienstadt camp in modern Czech Republic. 
There, Red Cross officials saw a respectable, if crowded, ghetto where Jewish residents were treated benevolently, fed adequately, and put to work under humane conditions. The Nazis even made a film about the camp to reassure the German public that nothing sinister was going on. But it was all lies. In reality, the camp had undergone an extensive beautification campaign prior to the visit, and as soon as filming was over, the cast, aka the prisoners, were rounded up and shipped off to the notorious Auschwitz death camp for extermination. Thankfully, in the end, the Nazis lost World War II, and both Hitler and Goebbels committed suicide in an underground bunker to avoid being held accountable for their crimes. In the aftermath of the war, the reality of the atrocities committed in the Nazi death camps were made known to the world so that, hopefully, we can avoid repeating them. Understanding propaganda is the first line of defense against ever again allowing a brutal and hateful dictator to commit such horrible crimes. It may have been easier to control the message in the 1930s, but the internet age presents its own challenges when it comes to fake news, disinformation, and propaganda. According to Simon Fraser University in Canada, there are some simple steps we can all take to spot propaganda and avoid falling victim to it. In the immediate aftermath of a big news event, the news outlets will always get it wrong. Wait for more information. Don't trust anonymous sources or sources that only cite other news outlets and take the time to compare multiple sources. Pay close attention to the language used by media outlets. For example, the phrase, we are getting reports, could mean anything at all. And finally, some of this is on us. Beware of reflexive sharing. Don't share sensational news on social media based on your first reaction. Do your due diligence before hitting that share button. Following these steps can help to ensure that nothing like Hitler's propaganda machine can be allowed to manufacture outrage, sow hatred, and incite violence ever again. If you thought this video was fascinating and horrifying, just wait until you see our other videos, like this video called World War II Nazi Breeding Plan. Or maybe this other video is for you. As always, thanks for watching and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.